as I've read this passage, part of the reason that, that I don't really like the idea of pruning, and I talked about this with Christoph, is because of the picture of pruning that I have in my mind. Like, honest, if, if I'm really honest with you guys, when I think of pruning, I honestly think of something kind of like this. Right? And, and I kind of have this idea of, of you know, kind of growing up, that if God wants to prune me, and, and I'm kind of like this vine growing up, that he's going to look, and in his love, he's going to come at me, and he's going to be like, ooh, there's so much deadness right there, and I'm just going to whack that off. And got an area of sin over there, and that's looking a little prideful, and that's looking a little selfish, and really you could do better there, and that just doesn't need to be there at all. And let's just keep going until by the time we're done, there is nothing nothing more than this little stubby, viney thing that is kind of left. And then when I am completely cut back, maybe, just maybe, God can grow and do something good out of that. When I described this to Kristoff, he looked at me and he said, Margaret, that is not how we prune vines in Napa Valley. And he said, Margaret, we, we actually use something like this. And I'm looking down thinking, cuticle clippers? Like for real? And he begins to describe how in his vineyard in Napa Valley, which is sometimes he actually manages about four of them. Some of them are only a half acre or an acre, or a couple of acres apiece. That he as the vintner will go through with these. And he'll go through three or four times per growing season with each different cluster of grapes. And he'll cut back just a leaf or or, or just a little bit of a branch so that each individual cluster of grapes will get just the right amount of sunlight and just the right amount of aeration to produce maximum flavor and maximum fruitfulness. And when Christoph described this to me, suddenly my heart turned and I said, God, if you want to prune me, have your way with me. Not just because I know that that which will be produced is worth laying everything down for, but because the approach you are taking is so much more tender and intimate and involved than I had ever imagined. But the second major image that is described in that passage in John 15 is the image of abiding. And it wasn't until I began to study more about viticulture that I started to grasp this. Because growing up in the church, I honestly thought that abiding and that idea in John 15 was a matter of just having like staying plugged into the vine right? I mean, as long as the grape is attached to the branch and the branch is attached to the vine, then we're all good. Just stay plugged into Jesus and it will all be okay. That's, that's what I grew up telling myself. And as Christoph began to unpack what it really takes to grow, not just good, but great grapes, this began to shift for me. Because what he described was that the abiding, the, the fruit, the being plugged in isn't just about this little teeny connection point, but it's about so much more. You see, if you want to plant a vineyard in Napa Valley, then you have to save up for a while in order to buy a small plot of land. Once you buy that plot of land, then you begin preparing the soil. In the very first year that you plant your vines, you don't plant seeds because those grow weaker vines. You actually plant shoots. And so you go through and you plant your shoots, and they start to grow up. At the end of the first year, you go back and you cut them back. And the second year, they grow up, and they grow up a little bit taller, and you cut them back again. And the third year, they grow up a little bit taller, and they start to produce some fruit, but you don't take it. No, 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 you cut it back again. And it's not until year four that your vines will grow up and produce a harvest, and you'll get to take that very first harvest. But if you are making wine in Napa Valley, that just means that you get to take the harvest, process the grapes, bottle it, and then begin aging it. And so for most vintners in Napa Valley, they will not get to taste the very first sip of their labor until year seven. And it won't be because of the financial investment until year 16, 18, or 20, until they reach a point of breaking even and even profitability in their investment. 
And as he described this, suddenly I began to understand a little bit more of the long-term perspective of God in our lives, in our ministry, and in our work. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I look at my life and I go, God, why am I not more fruitful right now? And it's like God is saying, it's winter. Do you know? But other times... He's saying, because the harvest that I'm really waiting for you to produce isn't going to come until year two or year 12 or year 20 or year 40. But if you will remain faithful and abide in me, I am faithful as the master vintner in order to bring it about. But it's not just in the time frame that the grapes grow and how long it takes to reach that break-even point. It's also in the very soil in which they are planted. Because you see, I always thought that if I wanted to grow great grapes, that I needed great fertile soil. I mean, go down to True Value, buy that big bag with the miracle Grow pellets, and you should be good to go. And Christoph was quick to correct me and say, Margaret, if you want to grow not good, but great grapes, then you actually want rocky, stony soil. Do you know that there is a winery in France called Chateau Lafitte? where they actually grow their grapes in 75% gravel. There are times when the vintner will go out there and he will look down at the soil and he will say, it is not stony enough. And he will plant more rocks in the soil because he knows that it is those rocks that produce the very distinctive character and flavor in the wine. And how often in my own life I look at God and I look at the rocks and the stones in my own life in our own churches and I go, God, but why won't that move? I have begged you, I have called on you, I have emptied my bag of charismatic evangelical Anglican tricks and it still won't budge. And God looks down and he says, because it is that very rock, it is that very difficult place with which I will produce the character of my son in you. And so in the midst of the vineyards, I again was reminded of the purpose and the place that God has for each of us, not only as individuals, but as leaders, to recognize that that which we are planting, the harvest that is coming may still be another 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years out. That incredible banner year that is so good that people will talk about. And yet if we are faithful to abide in him, what amazing things will abound. Why does God display himself in so many different metaphors to us? I think one of the reasons is simply that a single metaphor is not big enough to contain our God. He is simply too wonderful and magnificent to be summed up in a single image. But I think the second reason that God reveals himself in so many metaphors is because I don't know about you, but there are days when I need to know God in each of those metaphors. There are days that I need to know God as the good shepherd. I need to know him as the one who goes before, who leads, who guides, who restores, who anoints, who is the one who will pastor and care for me. There are other days that I need to know that just like a beehive, that God is intimately and intricately involved in our world and our lives. There are some days in ministry and in life when I just feel like I am flapping my wings. And yet in the beehive, I am reminded of God saying, but if you will just remain faithful to the role that I have called you to, what amazing sweetness will abound in my body because of your faithfulness. And there are times that like the vintner, that I needed to be reminded simply to abide in him, to remember that God takes a long-term perspective. And as much as I want the stones and the difficulties removed now, that sometimes those are the very things that produce Christ's flavor in my life. So my hope and my prayer for you as you move forward, as you continue seeking the Lord for what God has for you in your churches and in your communities and in your leadership, that you would continue scouting the divine. That as you are opening up the word, that God would reveal fresh light on the metaphors and the truth and the beauty of who he is, that you may communicate that 
with others, those you serve, those who you are seeking to reach, those who don't know Jesus yet. And in the process, the Holy Spirit would blow through, wiping away the dust that we may once again stand in wonder and awe of all he has done and all he has yet to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a God who gets your fingers dirty in the earth, revealing yourself in so many agrarian themes. Father, you are a God who associates yourself with the lowly shepherds and sheep. You reveal the intricacies and the wonders of who you are in a beehive. You remind us of your faithfulness and your long-term perspective of the one who is the Alpha and the Omega in the vineyard. Heavenly Father, stir our hearts to continue to seek you, to remain faithful, and to finish well. We thank you and we praise you for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen.